Good afternoon. The seminar is about to begin. We welcome you to Value-Based Purchasing in Action. Advisors share their strategies with David Cotorno, Mark Gagne, Craig Hasday, Tony Nyers, and Janet Troutwine, presented by the National Association of Health Underwriters Education Foundation. We hope you enjoy the program and we thank you for joining us today. A PDF copy of today's presentation has been made available to you to print or download. You may access this document by clicking the resource tab on the left side of your screen. You are encouraged to submit questions at any time throughout the broadcast by selecting the forum tab also located on the left side of your screen. Simply type your email address in your question and click send question. Today's presenters will answer questions throughout the program and questions not addressed within our available time may be answered by way of a post-conference email. Unfortunately, Ms. Troutwine could not attend today's webinar, but Chuck Alston will act as moderator in her absence. Chuck Alston is a Senior Vice President and Director of Public Affairs at Corvus MSL Group, a global public relations firm. He works on public affairs, marketing, policy, and reputation issues for diverse corporate and nonprofit clients, with a specialty in health and medical issues. For the last year, Chuck Alston has been the, count, the content partner with the NAHU Education Foundation on his grant made possible by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Mr. Alston. Please begin. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Unfortunately, Janet's flight was canceled, and her only flight back to D.C. today is in the air right now. So she asked me to step in and assume the role of moderator. As you've just heard, I've been working on this grant with Janet for the last year as the content partner representing MSL Corpus Group, and I look forward to getting your feedback and questions after the presentations. This is the ninth in a 10-part series examining the new healthcare landscape. And I just want to remind you, you can watch the first eight webinars online, on demand, at nahuef.inreachce.com. Uh, that link you'll see later on in the uh, presentation. The NAHU Education Foundation embarked on this endeavor after a conversation I had with Janet nearly 18 months ago. She shared that she thinks it's important for brokers, advisors, and agents to understand the changes taking place in vital areas, such as how health care providers are paid, how care is being delivered, and the momentum for greater price transparency so you can develop new strategies to work with your clients to get the best quality health care at the best price. We really designed these webinars with you in mind, and we know from the feedback surveys that those have, from those who have participated that they have rated the content very high and believe this information helps them to become more of an advisor. You've asked for some real-world examples, and that's what you will hear today. And again, I just want to echo what Jennifer said. Please send your questions throughout the presentation. Today's presenters are David Contorno, President of Lake Norman Benefits, serving individuals and businesses in both New York and North Carolina. David also serves on the Board of Directors for Health Reach Community Clinic and the North Carolina Insurance Commissioner's Life and Health Agent Advisory Committee. After David, you'll hear from Mark Gagne. He's the co-owner and chief innovation officer of Boris Law Insurance, serving individuals and businesses nationwide. He has served as the national chair of the Healthcare Cost Transparency Task Force, or NAHU, in addition to serving on the Legislative Council. He currently serves in a similar capacity, reporting directly to the NAHU Board of Trustees. Unfortunately, Craig Hasday, president of Frinkle Benefits, had a last-minute client conflict. Fortunately, his colleague, Eric Labaska, could join us. Eric is a senior vice president of Frankel Benefits with extensive experience with both commercial and public sector employers. His areas of expertise include a significant focus on self-funding contracts, conducting financial analysis, and budget forecasting. And bat and cleanup today will be Tony Nyers, risk management advisor and owner of the Healy Group, where he helps companies manage the risks associated with employment through benefit design and education. Tony has served on the benefits and conferences committees for SIIA and is currently serving as the chair of the Michiana Chapter of the American Heart Association. And I'm sure I pronounced that name wrong, Michiana. Please join me in welcoming David, Mark, Craig, and Tony. Excuse me, not Craig, Eric. We search for people doing innovative things and ask them to share their strategies so that they can be employed by you and your own businesses. And you're going to hear four very different approaches that are being taken. Next slide. While the approaches are different, there are some common themes among them, and some of those themes are, this can be a tough sell. Um, it's very complicated in some cases and not used to the way people are used to buying insurance for their employees. 
But the market is moving this way increasingly, so it's important to understand what's going on. More than ever, the broker agent must really be an advisor. There are lots of different decisions that need to be made out there as the landscape shifts rapidly. Creativity and patience are very important virtues when you're trying to implement value-based purchasing. The marketplace is bursting with third-party solutions. In many cases, you can plug and play. Clients have to invest time and, in some cases, money to make these transitions. As each of the speakers present today, I'd like to say a little bit about their firm and what your book of business is like as you begin your presentation. And we'll begin now with David Contorno. David? Thanks, Chuck. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, honored to be on this call and be speaking to you today. Um, a little history on, on myself and my firm. I, I've been doing benefits for over 20 years. I started up in New York and Long Island and, uh, you know, had, I guess, what would be considered a moderately successful business, but it was using the traditional models of, you know, let me put a spreadsheet together. Let me be um, the least expensive on that spreadsheet, and, and that's how I get the business from employers. I relocated to North Carolina in uh, 2007, end of 07, as a uh, change of life. Um, and my wife and I, previous to having kids, moved down. And I took about a year to decide if I wanted to even stay in the business and opted to do so. And saw an opportunity to really kind of start to do things differently. And I have to admit, uh, at first I started doing things the way that I had been doing them. And started to change. And, and the more I change, and this is true even in the last three months as much as the last three years, the more that I change my approach, the more I change how I speak to our clients, the more successful we've become. So in that evolution in North Carolina over the last seven years or so, started off with the small group. You know, I, I think as most agents and consultants, as you grow, you, you tend to grow to bigger clients as well. You tend to roll out more services and, and more marketing approaches that speak to larger clients. And so there's two things that are going on rapidly in our business. We're moving into larger and larger cases. We're focusing now on, you know, minimum of 100 employees all the way up to, you know, several thousand um, and uh, more and more self-funded. And some of what I'm going to talk about today, um, it, it, it really talks about how the underlying problem is not the insurance. The what the, the insurance rates that employers and employees feel are re, a result of the underlying problem. And I think it's actually great that Mark's after me because once you, once you address the issue, then you need to get into an environment in which you benefit from addressing those issues. And, and I think that's going to be the topic of Mark's conversation. So it took a lot for me to change, and I think it takes a lot for, um, for an employer to change, maybe even more. And they're used to us... Um, you know, having the cycle of getting a renewal, coming in with numbers that are above what they even feared. And then our solution is to beat the carriers up. And, you know, really, when you think about it, when you beat the carriers up, what, it, what, are, we, what are we doing as a, as a consultant? We are giving them as little information as possible in the hopes that they'll give us rates that ultimately are too low because the carrier that has the best information to accurately rate the group is the one that we're with now. They have the best information in terms of rating that case. So we're hoping that Blue Cross or Cigna or United will take the limited information, try and take a risk on the group, come in lower price. But if nothing changed in how the employees are using the plan, then nothing's going to change in what that renewal is going to be. Of course, the client doesn't see it that way. They think that the insurance company, quote, unquote, bought their business and came in at a low price. So the, the analogy that I give to clients is, you know, if, if they were to go out and if a business owner were to go out and shop their personal car insurance and they went to Geico and they saved 15% on their car insurance and a couple weeks later they decide to buy a new BMW, does the BMW dealership reduce the price of the car in any way because they just saved 15% on their car insurance? You know, of course not. The price of the car is not driven by the price of insurance. But if they're stepping out of a Hyundai into a BMW, doesn't the insurance rate go up? because the price of the car went up to ensure that car went up. And, and they look at, the, of course, the driving record, so the risk of the driver, that drives the insurance rates up. So the, the price of the car is not driven by the price of insurance, but the price of insurance is driven by the price of the car. And the same thing is true in health care. An employer's health care costs are not driven by their insurance rates. Their insurance rates, however, are absolutely driven by their health care costs. And what I try to 
uh, give them data behind is that in this country, we have an exceptionally high cost system. Most businesses know that. Most business owners know that, although they generally don't know to what extent. But we also have a really low quality system overall. We're ranked 34th in terms of quality by the World Health Organization. So we need to develop a plan and a strategy. And I know wellness has been the big buzzword, and, and I'm in no way saying wellness shouldn't be a part of it. But let's face it, people, when we put a wellness program out there for our clients, how many have done very poorly? And the ones that have done well, that have high participation, how many of them have the, the well people participating the most? That's what we tend to see. And those are not the people that we need to focus on. So what our approach has been is to give employees, a.k.a. consumers of health care, the ability to do something that they do everywhere else in, in everything they consume, and that is to care about the cost and the quality of care that they receive. So if we talk about uh, some of the, the, the tools, and you can flip to the next slide, um, and how we do this and how we engage this, let's look at areas first where quality doesn't matter. So let's talk about, for example, picking up a prescription. Well, generic Lipitor, which is the most prescribed drug in the country, can vary in price, strictly depending on what pharmacy you pick it up at, from between $16 and $90. So how do we get people to pick it up at the $16 place, especially if they have a $10 copay plan for that drug, where they're going to pay $10 either way? And I'll tell you how. There's a, there's a few ways that we do that. Number one, we point out if we're there... $70, they'd probably drive a couple miles out of the way. But we have to tie the consequence of that to what comes out of their paycheck next year, to what their employer can afford to pay them next year, to what their deductibles and co-pays are next year. And so we have to bring a level of transparency to the employer market. Uh, and we can do that on the small group side. We can do that on the large group side. In the small group side, we typically have the level funded plans, which was the slide that just changed. Um, and, and that brings, for those of you not familiar with level funded, that brings um, a payment schedule similar to a fully insured plan from the employer. So they have a fixed monthly cost. But what they're really doing is, is they're covering every month the fixed costs and one twelfth of the claims liability before the stop loss picks up. And at the end of the year, they look at how much was put into that claims bucket and how much was spent. And the employer typically gets some sort of refund on the difference. And that's what I mean by bringing transparency. I had a, a, a prospect. They weren't a client of mine. He owned a pest extermination company. And he was about to go adjusted community rated because of the Affordable Care Act. He got his renewal, and it was a... a 49% increase. And he calls in the presses. He holds a news conference in this little town in North Carolina, and he winds up getting all this attention. And all of his focus is on the insurance company. So I found this as an interesting uh, experiment. I said, you know what? You're fully insured now. How about I take insurance out of the picture? Let's put you into a self-funded environment. Now, I don't think you're going to like the answers any better. But what I do think is that you're going to start to focus on what the problem is. And I'm not saying insurance companies are blameless at all. But at the end of the day, everything that insurance companies do, whether it's step therapy, pre-authorization, higher deductibles, narrower networks, those are all in response to one thing, the amount that we're spending on health care. So we have to get the employer into an environment in which there's transparency, number one, and shared savings if these things work, number two. Next slide, please. So some of the tools that I'm trying to remember the next slide before it pops up here. I know there's a little bit of a lag. But some of the tools that we use to do this or that my agency uses to do this, um, they can vary. And really they need to be um, – you need to get the pulse of the employer and the employees and what they're going to allow you to do. But a lot of people are not familiar with Medibid. So Medibid is kind of like lending tree for healthcare. So lending tree, if I need a loan, I tap in what type of loan I need, how much I need, some details on my credit, and I go out to market. And it comes back with 20 banks, and I get details on their financial rating, what my payment will be, what my interest rate is, and I can pick the, the, the offer that I want. Well, Medibid works that way too. They've contracted with dozens of providers around the country. Many of them are big names 
And you're, uh, if the employer pays for access for their employees to Medibid, which is not much, the employee can go in, type in what type of procedure they need. I need my hip replaced. And it might find them a place halfway across the country that comes out to be the highest quality and the lowest cost. It'll give them a selection. And it typically is between 30 and 60% less expensive than the average, the national average, with a higher quality outcome. So one of the plan designs that we've implemented is we'll take a, and you can only do this in self-insured, is we will take a plan and we'll write the plan document so that the employee has half the deductible or, or even less if they use Medibid as compared to if they don't. So that's pretty aggressive or pretty progressive, depending on how you look at it. Let's talk about a softer one. Healthiest You is another product we use. We love this product. So it is a combination of things. Number one, High quality, 24-7, 365 access to telemedicine where you can uh, speak to a doctor who can diagnose, prescribe, and treat. It is also a prescription price tool and a service price tool. So you can price out MRIs and radiology and labs, some, you know, not major surgeries, but some routine things. But here's the key that makes this different because all those things somewhat exist. It has a geolocation reminder system. So when I step foot in a pharmacy, it pops up on my phone and says, hey, I see you're in a pharmacy. Would you like to price out a medication here and other pharmacies around you? So when the employee goes in, they're actually reminded. It does the same thing in an emergency room or urgent care. It says, hey, we see you're in an emergency room. If it's a true emergency, go. But would you like to speak to a doctor to see if they can treat you over the phone before incurring the expense or waiting the time? And it is a really high-quality 24-7 doc service. Next screen, please. So I'll continue going on. But what these start to do is a softer way and a harder way of saying to employees, you need to start to look into the cost and the quality of care that you receive. So all of those are kind of soft approaches because in most cases they still allow the traditional way of going. And we do have ways of incentivizing employees to use the system. But let's talk about a really hardline approach. Hardline approach would be using the services of a TPA like ELAP that engages in a reference-based pricing model. So basically what they do is when uh, what they allow on a charge, what an employer would pay, is going to be 106% of cost or 140% of Medicare, whatever is greater. And most hospitals, and typically we only do this at facilities, but most facilities are accepting Medicare anyway. So what this would do is it'd say to the hospital, look, we're going to give you this amount, which is probably a heck of a lot less than, than the private insurance reimbursement rates. And essentially, if the employee didn't deal with this in advance to some level, then they're going to be left over with the balance potentially. Now, ELAP has a pretty aggressive in-house legal team to help deal with that, but essentially we're saying to the employee, look, you need this surgery. We know the local hospital charges 80000 but we know that it should only cost 20000 so we're going to give you 6% more than 20000 and spend it however you want, wherever you want, but that's all you get. So that would be an extreme version of it. The other thing we do is we've successfully negotiated direct pricing with local hospitals. So if we have an employer who has a concentration of employees in an area that has a local hospital, especially if they're surrounded by these big systems, we can create a contract arrangement with that hospital, that smaller hospital system directly, where they give us better discounts than the standard network discounts. And in turn, the employer gives the employees incentive to go there, such as lower deductibles, lower copays. Uh, and that's also been very successful, especially if we can prove the hospital has high quality services, they have the star ratings at CMS or the readmission rates. Next slide, please. So, this takes time. You can't do this in one year. And I get the comment a lot, well, this all sounds good, but how do we know this is going to save money? And my answer is we don't know it's going to save money. As a matter of fact, a lot of it's dependent on the client and the employees to work. But what you're doing hasn't been saving money. So I can tell you that if you keep doing that, you're not going to save money. And you know, we've had clients whose rates have gone down several years in a row without needing to change plan design in any way as a result of this. So I've seen very, very strong anecdotal evidence that, that this works. The insurance companies don't like this, generally speaking, especially the blue ones. And uh, 
they're very much trying to keep things as untransparent as possible, just like the providers are. That's the environment in which they thrive in, and that's the one in which they're used to. So I think it's on us to get our employers to pay for health care differently and to have their employees pay for health care differently and to start to think about the ID card that their employees carry around as though it were a corporate credit card and to start to put incentives and measures and controls on it in a similar fashion and give them the tools to find high-quality care at a low price because it's out there even though overall the system is flipped the other way. I think I'm about out of time. Is that my last slide? Yep. Perfect. Thanks. So Thanks. I'll flip it over to Mark. Great. Thank I'll you, David. And next, next up is uh, Mark Gagne. And Mark, first, if you'd tell people a little bit about Borislow and then move into your presentation. Okay, great. Thanks, Chuck. Appreciate it. I'm honored to uh, be on the call as well and appreciate the Education Foundation uh, sponsoring this webinar series. It's actually been my pleasure to participate on the previous eight, now ninth. Uh, so thank you to everyone. Um, I've been an advisor, employee benefit advisor, for about a decade, a little bit over a decade. And uh, our business has been in business for almost 30, uh, 33 years, or going on 34 years. Uh, we are strategic advisors to 350 corporate clients, uh, covering about 40,000 employees and 100,000 belly buttons if you include all their family members. Uh, we have a very, uh, what I would call a flat, flexible, interdependent business model uh, that's been designed to um, tailor itself to the unique goals and objectives and challenges that our clients face. We have a team of experts who collaborate with our clients to create innovative uh, and creative solutions to, uh, to solve their, their challenges, whatever they may be. If you take a look at traditionally the uh, 50 to 500 marketplace, uh, you'll see that most of those types of employers will manage costs through premium contribution and plan design because the lion's share of them fully insure their risk. In other words, they transfer their risk to the insurance company. And they do this for a number of reasons, most of which is a lack of education about the fact that they're overpaying in, in many cases, in most cases actually, uh, for the cost of that insurance. And so with that as a backdrop, uh, we created a, uh, rather we have a, a large footprint in the education space uh, in our organization. We work with over 100 uh, private uh, boarding and day schools. And they traditionally have purchased in, uh, in collective associations uh, purchasing pools. And as an advent of the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, unfortunately, those uh, association pools that had been together for decades uh, ultimately ended up having to disband. And so we saw this coming down the coming down the pike with regard to uh, to what the ACA was going to do with the, to the way that they were uh, they were managing their risk. And so what we determined was the best way to move forward was to leverage a financing solution that's really been around for a long time since the 50s. Um, it's called a captive insurance arrangement. And uh, the name of our program is called Captivated Health. And this is not a commercial for Captivated Health, rather a discussion with all of you about how the captive works and, and what, how we're finding it being to be a successful uh, solution for our, uh, for our clients. And the biggest reason they're interested in, in pursuing this type of thought process we're finding is they have a greater need for control of their future and they're looking for a greater efficiency from the way in which they're purchasing their health insurance. You see, this looming thing out there called the Cadillac tax that kicks into play in 2018 will put a 40% excise tax on plan values, plan values, by the way, which include FSA, HRA, and HSA, uh, whether they're contributed by the employer or employee, at least that's the initial guidance we're getting, will make many employers run into the Cadillac tax sooner than they, than they would really like to. So I think our job as advisors is to create a long-term strategy that helps them squeeze efficiency, both in terms of plan design, uh, creating a culture of health and well-being, but also leveraging a more efficient financing mechanism uh, for their health care. So introducing Captivated Health. Uh, we designed it for the education institutions that we represent. Uh, we have 12 organizations in three states covering roughly 2,200 belly buttons. Uh, it's a risk management strategy that helps them retain more control over their health plan and reduce costs by improving quality and leveraging many of the tools and resources that David was talking about in his presentation, being a more informed and educated healthcare consumer. So it's not withholding care. It's squeezing more efficiency out of the dollar that you're spending for that care. The whole backdrop of this program is to provide members, not the rule makers, but the members, the consumers who are actually using healthcare with the tools and the resources they need so they can be confident that administratively they understand what their plan covers, they understand uh, what they have to pay, and they also understand how they're going to pay 
for that care? And then clinically, are they getting the right care in the right place at the right time by the right provider? And we all know that all providers are not created equal, just like all strategic advisors are not created equal, just like anything in life. So what we want to do is replace the thought process with the less bad renewal. What do I mean by that? I got one well, less than trend renewal. So if trend is 8% at ACA taxes, fees, and assessments, it's another 3%. You have an 11% renewal and you deliver a 9 and that's something to celebrate? No, it's not something to celebrate because 9% is still five to six times the rate of inflation. and It's not sustainable for the clients that, that we represent, nor I'm sure is it for the audience who's listening in. So we can go to the next slide. A captive insurance arrangement essentially provides insurance to and is controlled by its owner members, and that's an important part. This is an ownership shift. So as opposed to working with a client and be, having them be a buyer of health care, this shifts them into the role of being an owner of the health care that they're buying on behalf of their employees. Those owner members share a common cause, and frankly, it's to improve the efficiency and the way that they're financing their health care program. And they can do that in concert with an overall uh, comprehensive approach to consumerism, health, and well-being. The captive insurance arrangement what makes it unique is if you try to uh, traditionally self-insure a client and there are 50 employees or 60 employees, first of all, you have no claim information, so it's a big guess. Uh, secondarily, the volatility of those claims, uh, of those, in, those organizations, is substantial. And so when you take that client out to the, uh, to the reinsurance market, you're going to get very conservative if you can get it, get it at all, a stop-loss policy to help mitigate that risk and that volatility they have. And that's what the captive does is it represents or replicates rather the size and stability of a larger employer to help small and mid-sized organizations partially self-insure and enter this world of taking risk for the claims that their employees generate. Aggregating risk really helps those organizations decrease volatility and have a higher level of predictability. And obviously everyone on this, phone, on this uh, webinar rather understands that insurance is the law of large numbers. So what self-funding does just straight out the gate, before you've even gotten more creative with regard to how you're educating people to make better decisions, more informed decisions about health care and live a healthy lifestyle, straight away you, you have sidestepped one of the taxes called the health insurance company tax or what we in the business call the hit tax. And depending on whether you're insured by a non-for-profit insurer, which is at the lower end, or a for-profit insurer, which is at the higher end, your client's going to sidestep that big tax straight away. Next slide. When you think about uh, a captive insurance arrangement in terms of its financing solution, you have to understand what it's predicated on, so the philosophy or the underpinning of it. If we look at claims, you have severity and you have frequency. There are areas of claims that are completely predictable. Let's call that, for the sake of this discussion, up to $50,000 or what you might deter what we would all call a uh, specific deductible level. So let's say for every 50, uh, claim under $50,000, those are your most predictable claims. They're your lumps and bumps, your aches and pains, your broken bones. They're nothing that's usually life-threatening, and they're highly predictable. This is where insurance carriers make the most amount of money in their margin built into their fully insured premium. Then there's an area of risk. Let's call it between fifty dollars and $250,000. That is less predictable, but still somewhat predictable. These are things that uh, might be cancer, you know, cancer treatment, could be a hip replacement, a knee replacement, some type of surgery, normally not life-threatening, although it could be. But the reality is these claims are somewhat less predictable, so we're going to share that layer of risk with other entities that are participating in this risk financing mechanism. And then finally, for claims that are above 250000 carve those off and have those covered completely by reinsurance. So by understanding the predictability and probability and the level of unpredictability uh, between that, the lower end of the healthcare spectrum and the higher end, you can help your client get more efficient about the way that they're purchasing their health care. Next slide. So the way the program works is the organization first has to decide that it wants to be self-insured. And I, I think David had mentioned in his comments that not every client is going to be suitable to be self-insured. The two things that you're going to want to talk to your clients about are A, is their level of risk tolerance, and B, is their, their uh, uh, suitability to actually take that risk. You may have a client with a very strong balance sheet, one that ultimately would like to take the risk, but then you do an analysis and you see that they really it doesn't make sense for them to be so. So as an example, the client had a 150% medical loss ratio. That means for every dollar of premium they're paying, they're transferring $1.50 to the insurance carrier. That is not a client who would be appropriate for this type of risk mechanism. Uh, but at the end of the day, most clients don't run in that in that uh, that hot zone, so to speak. So the first thing an organization has to do 
is decide that it wants to be self-insured and that it's suitable to be self-insured. The second thing that happens is that organization purchases a stop-loss policy, both specific and aggregate insurance, to protect them from that volatility and also give them a cap on their annual exposure. The last, next thing they do is they join a captive, and that captive actually essentially receives some of the seeded premium from the stop-loss insurance policy, which enables it mechanically to allow risk sharing across multiple entities in this risk pool known as a captive insurance arrangement. So let's take a claim example. Next slide, please. So if we take ABC organization, they've adopted in this program a $50,000 specific deductible. And they have a $600,000 claim for a premature delivery. What happens? Well, what happens is under the self-funded program, ABC would fund the first $50,000 via, via its self-funded retention level. The stop-loss policy then would come in and fund the next $550,000. And then the group captive would be reimbursed, so that captive layer that's being shared by all the, month, all the members in that risk cell, the next 250000 is then refunded back to the stop-loss policy provider. So mechanically speaking, this is how that liability uh, train would flow relative to this particular claim example. Next slide, please. So if we look at a real organization, and I've taken the name of the organization out to protect the innocent, uh, this is a real organization with real results after a, a full mature view. Actually, the end of this month will be the 15th month of the program, and I'm happy to report the results are, are exceedingly uh, positive uh, for our clients. Uh, every organization in the program has actually saved money uh, because they were overpaying for the cost of insurance before, and now, we've, now we have proof of concept. In this example, we, had, we projected their claims would be about $383,000. Their actual claims, this is through uh, the end of September, so we have one more month of, uh, of, of mature claims to come in. But we put a little, bit, a little bit of incurred but not reported, so a little bit of IBNR in our claim number shows that it's 308000 So their retained risk reduction, in other words, what they expected versus what they had paid, on a mature basis is $75,000, or 20% under what we expected their cost to be when they were underwritten by us and by the stop-loss carrier. Now, what does that mean relative to what they could have gotten in a fully insured market? Well, in this client's particular case, they were spending on a fully insured basis $950,000. We projected um, before they came into the program that they would have actual and fixed and variable costs of $682,000 or an initial projection of $153,000. We actually delivered a $267,000 savings through this program on their behalf. Uh, captive layer final accounting for all of the organizations in the in the program has not been done yet. It actually takes an 18-month cycle. Uh, but at the end of the day, we know that the, the captive is performing the way it's expected to perform. And in this particular uh, client's case, the organization received a negative 6% renewal, and they set their rates at zero because they're now learning that they should set reserves aside in years in which they have positive form performance so they can use uh, those reserves for years in which they might have a more challenging claim situation. Next slide, please. So now I'll kind of share with you about the program in terms of the approach that we've taken with our client base. Let me step back and probably share the most important thing with all of you. The captive insurance arrangement is not magic. It sets the stage for you to do magical things with your clients, doing the things that David was talking about in his presentation. But you have to come at it from the right perspective. And the right perspective is turning upside down the model we have with healthcare, which is right now rule maker down versus consumer up. If we all approach our clients from the consumer up, helping them get engaged, educated, and empowered, make smart healthcare decisions, and live a healthier lifestyle, they can see where they're spending money, every dollar is accounted for, and that we can build member level confidence both administratively and clinically. Magical things will happen with regard to people's health and well being and how much money they're spending to keep their health or to improve their health or to restore their health if they're in a healthcare situation. Through the program, it's important that you offer tools and resources that help people do that. So one of the things that we do when we sit around our organization strategizing about how we can improve the program is anything that's advanced, we'll ask the question straight away, if you were a member of this plan, is this something you would find valuable? So the tools that you see represented, and there's just a cross-section of them down below, are built through that lens. So as an example, we use Best Doctors. It's an organization that was founded by two Harvard MDs here in the Boston area. They've been in business for, for 25 years. They have 30 million people 
that they provide clinical concierge or what we call second opinion uh, advice to. Uh, this organization uh, has actually created a sophisticated Gallup polling tool that would allow um, uh, the creation of a network of specialists in every specialty and subspecialty. They have created a their own network of 50,000 physicians out of our 800,000 that exist in this country. And again, remember, they're pure rank. So it's not somebody outside the business, it's someone inside the business for ranking them. In their 25-year history, these statistics still blow me away. 37% of the time we're diagnosed, it's wrong. That's four out of ten times. 75% of the time we're diagnosed accurately. Even if we're diagnosed accurately, we're getting the wrong treatment plan. That's 8 out of 10 times. So having a clinical concierge or a second opinion is not to suggest that people shouldn't trust their doctor, but we should never take our health care at face value, and we should make sure that we have expert resources to help us make those types of decisions. Next slide, please. In our program, we've, we've furthered that scientific approach by, by ensuring that everyone is operating on the same page. So in our program, you can only participate if you have a consumer-driven health plan. And for those that may not know, a consumer-driven health plan is the combination of a lower premium plan uh, with a higher deductible. And fastened to that chassis is the health savings account or a health reimbursement arrangement, one, the other, or both. No first dollar covered plan so that the members are all operating with the incentive and the ability to see what health care costs. We, ought, we make sure that every, every organization in the program is adopting a culture of health and well-being. You see, these are not options when you're sharing risk with people. Everyone needs to be on the same page relative to what they're doing. They may not have the same results, but they need to make sure they're operating under the same premise. There are other things that we do in the program that you would do as an advisor, that it gives you the opportunity now that you have claim experience and actual data on your employer groups that you can actually start to pinpoint and do some of the things that David was talking about and are listed here um, on the slide uh, for your clients that you can be much more efficient about the way that they're purchasing health care. Last slide, please. The biggest challenges any organization is going to face when they're considering a solution like a captive insurance arrangement is their mindset and, frankly, their level of risk tolerance. And that mindset is really critical. That, that's the go or no-go in this type of discussion. You have to gather that information before you spend any time with your client talking about a solution like this because if their mindset is not one of consumerism, health, and well-being, if they don't share uh, an appetite for risk or, frankly, you already know they're not suitable for that risk, you're wasting your time. What you have to do with your clients is ask them, uh, are you a buyer of health care or do you want to be an owner of the health care, in other words, an owner of the risk that you're, that you're trying to finance? Is your organization a cost shifter? Are you a fence sitter? Are you an innovator? You see, this solution is very innovative, creative, and market-leading. Not everybody wants to be out on the front edge or what some would call the bleeding edge. And finally, is there a language or knowledge barrier? There is a, uh, a misconception with many employers who are fully insured suggesting to themselves that being self-insured is somehow scary. It does introduce the element of risk, but that risk can be controlled. It can be mitigated, and it can be addressed. In fact, we're not talking about less bad renewals now. We're talking about cost decreases uh, as opposed to a less bad renewal that's under trend. And as an advisor, from our perspective, you must determine your client's risk tolerance and suitability to take that risk. That's the first step in your process that tells you whether this solution would be appropriate for them. So, Chuck, that's, uh, that, uh, that ends uh, my part of the presentation, and I guess we'll go on to the next speaker. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. And just a reminder to the folks on the call, uh, you can submit a question um, by going to the left side of your screen in the forum. Next, we're going to hear from Eric Labaska. Don't be fooled by Craig Hasbay's picture. This is his colleague, Eric, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck. I do appreciate uh, everyone's time and, and having uh, having me come on to uh, do this uh, discussion and this presentation. apologize on behalf of Craig Hasbay. Um, as it was mentioned, he was pulled away uh, for a pretty important meeting, so uh, I report directly to Craig uh, here at Frankel, uh, Frankel Benefits. We're a shop located in New York City. We have uh, uh, roughly approximately 250 employees. Uh, we have offices up in Boston, New York City, New Jersey, um, and a couple of satellite locations throughout the states. Um, but we're a good-sized shop here up in the Northeast. And um, uh, with that, I wanted to um, uh, talk to you about some of the slides that uh, really, uh, both David and Mark had uh, kind of been talking about already in, in consumerism and helping the employees provide these tools. Uh, because as we see 
um, uh, out there in the marketplace with the high deductible health plans and, and the, the big push towards those low cost drivers. Um, everyone's trying to equip the employees to have those expert resources uh, so they can actually see what those cost, uh, those healthcare dollars are going to and what it's going to cost them uh, to get their skin in the game. One of the solutions that Frankel is providing to our, our membership is uh, another resource called Zest Health. Uh, basically, it's a uh, online program. It's, uh, it works through your phone, uh, through a phone application, uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, 24 seven access. Uh, to uh, registered nurses that are online, uh, there's various things they can they can download uh, the application, and um, they'll see that the cost of care based upon where their current aggregates are, their aggregators are for the deductibles and their coinsurance levels. That's going to tie into the high deductible health plan that the employer elects. Um, and with that, they, there's a concierge service that the uh, that the member would have access to by just by pressing a button. Uh, they can call a doctor. They can have the concierge. I uh, reach back out to them. Uh, the concierge service is available 24-7. Uh, they can help assist them with uh, trying to evaluate the condition that, that, that they have, um, help establish or set the, uh, the actual um, appointment with a provider's office, trying to drive that member in, in network, as well as there being a, a, a tool available uh, so that the member can actually take a look to see what the cost would, would be uh, uh, for any given procedure uh, based upon parameters or zip code location of where that employee is, is uh, residing. So they can see the cost of care uh, amongst the spectrum uh, for various providers that would be in network and try to select the, the least cost option for them. So that's just on Zest Health. Um, uh, again, just uh, trying to push steerage uh, to get the member. Uh, if you could turn to the next, next slide. Um, visibility on price and, and the quality measures trying to steer those members in, in network um, because of the concierge service and the, and the RN. Uh, they can tie that back into teledoc service as well uh, for better outcomes. Um, you know, it's less friction. I like to say less stress out of healthcare uh, because, again, with, with these the, 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 the marketplace trying to drive consumerism and into these high deductible health plans, uh, a lot of these HR services, HR departments aren't equipped to handle this, uh, a lot of the uh, questions and, and, and uh, concerns that are coming back from the members, from their employees, on, on, on driving care and, and what's the best outcome for them. Uh, because these members can't evaluate the cost of care. They, uh, they're not equipped to negotiate uh, some of these concerns. So uh, that's really the, uh, the gist of um, dealing with Zest Health. And again, it's a lot of the, the same topics that both David and Mark had stressed. And it, it's on these more larger, successful agencies, uh, that's, these are the solutions that we're bringing in uh, for our clientele. Our next slide, which is very interesting, that, that Frankel, uh, that we do for our clients is really pharmacy. You know, everybody understands that pharmacy is kind of considered a black box. They, uh, no one really understands the moving parts and the various pieces that uh, are in these contracts. A lot of times we see employer groups in the mid-sized market, uh, they go into a self-funding uh, contract or a model with a, one of the big four carriers but their, uh, their pharmacy contracts are very vague. Uh, they don't go into a lot of detail on, uh, on, uh, on the services or what the average wholesale pricing of these medications are. Uh, more importantly, what specialty, what's considered specialty, and what those discounts are involved to. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, unknowns around the prescription drug pharmacy, and we've been picking up a lot of uh, new uh, employer groups, new clients, uh, just by talking about pharmacy fees. It's something that's being overlooked by a lot of consultants. Uh, consultants out there um, for these groups that are out there going into the self-funding model uh, but not really knowing what's going on with the prescription drug piece. Uh, if you could on the next slide, we're using a uh, another a third party service such as it's another one that's out there it's called Truveris uh, to really manage the PBM process on our behalf. Uh, they in essence will put together a regimented uh, P, uh, RFP response uh, that usually about five or six uh, PBMs will respond to. Um, uh, we send the, the parameters to them. Uh, each one of these PBMs, it's, it's kind of uh, 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 conducted online through the resources, um, and they respond online based upon the questions and answers uh, that, they, 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 that they submit back to the uh, Traveris, for example, for the RFP. Um, it's, it's usually a narrow field that uh, once they, it, it hits about five or six uh, PBM responses, 
uh, then we try to uh, pick the top three uh, responses out of that PBM response uh, and, and ask them to uh, go in for a second, uh, a second round of competing uh, for these clients. And what usually happens is that these carriers will uh, initially issue, these PBMs will issue a first round rate uh, based upon rebates and, and discounting. And then um, when they get to, to the best and final version or stage where they're, they're being invited to, to be the top two or top three PBMs, uh, they usually sharpen their pencil to get down a little bit, um, a little bit further, uh, more of an aggressive proposal on behalf of the client. And at that point, is when the uh, the client will select a winner uh, to determine. All right, uh, which which PBM would, would we uh, like to see or like to go to in this um, uh, in, in these scenarios for this uh, uh, bidding process? Now, on the next slide, one of the examples that we uh, typically see in a savings uh, uh, is usually about an eight to twelve percent savings, typically uh, off of um, uh, the current arrangements that are in place for some of the bigger. Uh, their uh, insurance, nationwide insurance carriers that are out there uh, from those contracts of what they see, again, in the 8 to 12% range. Um, we recently just did one case, and um, we, we achieved a 16% savings, uh, which was really nice because if you really take a look with a prescription drug hitting about a 25% of spend on the medical overall, you know, this will, this will be about a 4% savings on the impact for, uh, for that client, specifically with no plan design changes, uh, nothing whatsoever. Uh, just by sending out the market, getting tightening up the uh, definitions surrounding specialty care, identifying what the rebates are going to be, and uh, uh, getting more aggressive on what the discounts are, are available out in that marketplace. Um, you know, of course, uh, a program such as this on the next slide. Um, there's obviously a fee that's got to be uh, uh, discussed up front um, with this uh, type of service. Uh, but normally uh, the, the fee is a nominal amount because really what we're uh, focused on for employers that usually have about a $2 million spend for prescription drug, uh, that's where this type of uh, an arrangement really works out really nice because uh, that's where the PBMs will really start aggressively marketing and trying to compete uh, for, those, uh, for those clients. Um, some of the, uh, like the, a drawback, though, is that when, when you when you sit down and talk with your our, your employer groups, is um, trying to get them to understand that because we're going to be breaking apart the prescription drug and the medical component, that they're going to have to have two ID cards in essence. So um, sometimes the employees, uh, it's going to take a little bit for them to get used to that, uh, but there would be that need to discuss the uh, to having two two different drug cards uh, um, uh, to de to deal with when they go and access the system. Um, but again, uh, we, we're seeing this, uh, and we're seeing this uh, type of services come down in, in market space. Uh, there's another program or, or opportunity with something like this, uh, because with the prescription drug, we can also, through, through the company of Truvaris, be able to provide a, um, for groups that are uh, under that $2 million threshold, uh, another alternative to take a look at moving into a capitated arrangement um, uh, with prescription drug, but yet being able to participate in that savings. So these are just some of the areas that uh, we're trying to uh, roll out with, with groups. So we're seeing a lot of success um, uh, in that in that market space uh, because, again, a lot of people are, aren't talking about prescription drug because a lot of people don't understand it. The clients don't understand it, uh, all the various moving parts, whether you're dealing with a rebate, whether you're dealing with uh, an average wholesale price, uh, mail order, generic, uh, the specialty drug medications. Uh, these carriers have a lot of moving, uh, moving targets with what they classify as a specialty. So with that, we, we like this to utilize the, this type of service because it really, um, will kind of put structure around it. But more importantly, when a client decides to go in that direction, uh, the service of such, of one of these PBMs is, We'll be able to monitor those claim activity and audit those claims activity on a monthly basis. Uh, a lot of times, these larger employers will do a, a drug audit, uh, maybe 12 months or 18 months after the fact. Whereas moving into an arrangement such as this, uh, the companies such as Travaris will actually monitor the claims on a monthly basis, so that the, the client will know that when they get that bill in the mail and they're seeing um, uh, that uh, that that uh, the claim list 
that that claim list has actually already been audited and is factual based upon the contract that was committed to by the PBM. So, I mean, that's where we're hitting a, a lot of success uh, rates with, uh, with this type of service, and uh, it just tries to, um, again, open the, uh, the clarity and open uh, open form for the employers so they can see really what are, are all these moving parts and all these moving pieces as they're getting higher educated in the self-funded arena. So Great, thank I mean, you. with that, um, yep. I'll turn it back over. Yeah, thank you, Eric. That was really informative. You know, one of the questions we've gotten all year long is what in the heck can I do about drug prices? So thanks for that. <laughs> next we're going to hear next we're going to hear from Tony Nyers. Tony? Uh, and just a reminder before Tony starts that up on the left side of your screen, you can send us your questions. Thanks. Go ahead, Tony. Sorry. A little bit of a... Uh, this is Tony. I was on mute. <laughs> so my apologies. Uh, a brief... Uh, for me, I've been in this business for about 20 years, and I have uh, um, started out... Uh, my first 10 years on the operation side in a third-party administrator working on self-funded plans. Um, and then uh, I, I became an agent about uh, 11 years ago. Uh, so I shifted over to that side um, and have been working with typically larger plans, but I, I do deal with some small plans too. Um, so, so if you would go to the next slide. Um, so what I what I have done um, it's going to follow some of the similar themes of, the, of, of what folks have talked about uh, here today. Um, I getting this down to to the nuts and bolts and actually being able to, to get an employer to start taking the steps. Um, I've used a three tiered approach. Uh, I start with a high deductible health plan with an HRA. Um, we do something that's unique. We put some first-dollar benefits in there for essential care, um, things like waiving drug copays um, for diseases that you want uh, individuals to be taking their drugs, and I'll, I'll dive down into that in a little bit. Um, and then adding some of the price transparency tools um, and including some tools with a uh, pre-certification process where there is some outreach um, to folks. Uh, on that. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so for us, um, you know, the best time to move someone um, from a tra traditional PPO to, to a high deductible plan is um, when they're having a really awful renewal on, on that traditional PPO plan. Uh, one of the big barriers we get to with that is time. So I always try to introduce that um, at, a, uh, at an off renewal to throw it out there as a potential strategy going forward. But the plan that I've, I've landed on most uh, is to move people to a $3,000 deductible with a, with a $1,000 HRA. I much prefer the HRA over an HSA because the HRA gives you a little more flexibility um, from the employer's perspective on how you design it, um, although you cannot use an HRA for anybody that's an owner, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, so you do, with, with owners of companies, you can have an HSA. An HSA, as you know, is a deposit into somebody else's bank account, and um, so 100% of it gets spent every year. When I go with this design, with a $1,000 HRA, and we double that for anybody that's got dependent coverage, um, we see that employers are going to spend about 40% of what that uh, HRA pledges uh, for a year. Um, so it's a lot more cost effective than just depositing money in somebody else's bank account. Uh, so that that $1,000 HRA, I always do that um, as an upfront, so first dollar benefit, and we always um, set that up so that it 100% of what's not used rolls over into the next year. Um, I cap the rollover at either the deductible or if we're doing um, uh, and, and, and a high deductible plan with um, co-pays after you hit the deductible, um, then I... I, I can cap that out at the out-of-pocket maximum for the plan. 
Um, so once somebody hits the deductible, if we're doing it that way, um, then their HRA doesn't grow anymore, but they also have earned themselves 100% benefit after several years of good um, uh, performance under the plan. So you're rewarding those people that don't cost you very much, uh, and you're making your plan attractive to the young and healthy people. Uh, but the other thing that you do, and I think the thing that's most powerful with this, is people will start to see that HRA money as their own money, and they spend it that way. We notice that um, mostly, uh, uh, or most evident, um, when in, in the utilization of generic drugs. So when we put somebody on a plan like this, it, we'll typically see that they're trending about 80% of their drugs uh, drug purchases, and that's by prescription, not by cost. Uh, Eighty percent of their um, drugs are being uh, are, are generic purchases, and that sounds pretty good on the surface. But after we put this in place, within a year, they'll drive that um, uh, generic utilization up to eighty percent, and it dramatically impacts their drug utilization. We also see a lot of transfer from formulary brand or non-formulary brand name drugs uh, to formulary brand because the copays typically just don't provide enough incentive. Um, always on these plans, the drugs count towards the deductible as well. Um, on to the next slide. Um, we do some carve-outs. The um, carve-outs are essentially first dollar benefits. So people don't have to get into their HRA for these. Um, we've done them primarily with drugs that treat um, the five disease categories that you see here, diabetes, any cardiac issues, hypertension, high cholesterol, and asthma. Uh, and and the, the thought process is ultimately it's cheaper for the plan for these people um, uh, to, to utilize their drugs. Sometimes on these high deductible health plans, we know that employees can't afford a $3,000 deductible. Um, at least our lowest paid employees have great degree of difficulty. So if you have somebody that's in that category and let's say they have high blood pressure and they need to be on medication, once they exhaust that HRA, um, they may stop taking their medication. Well, that can be catastrophic for your plan. So we encourage our employers to let's carve those out and let's give those, um, uh, if an employee will agree to enroll in a, a condition-specific disease management program, we will offer them uh, the lowest cost alternative in their therapeutic category, so a generic drug, if you will, uh, to help manage their condition and have it be at no copay and have that not hit their HRA. Um, that encourages them to stay healthy and stay on the plan. Uh, again, we're attacking, uh, we're, we're driving some con consumerism, but here we're attacking the issues that are costing our plan the most money. So we're, we're taking care of the maintenance, doing the pay me now a little bit so we don't have to pay later a lot. Uh, going on to the next slide. Um, we've coordinated on, on some of our self-funded plans um, uh, through the pre-certification process. We've identified a lot of low-hanging fruit um, in our local providers here in the area um, for some, uh, some particular types of services. Now, when somebody wants to go to do something like an MRI, um, they're going to be at their primary care physician or maybe in an ER uh, if, it's a, if it's a broken bone or something, and they'll be sent for a, an MRI, and they're going to just go wherever they're sent. Um, they don't realize that uh, there are some high-cost providers in our area. Well, we've identified a lot of those um, for things like, you know, MRIs, colonoscopies, mammograms. There's a wide range of pricing even amongst people that are in network. So um, in some of our plans, we actually have an outreach. So if they pre-search and we see that the intent is to go to one of our one of the high-cost providers, um, we'll actually outreach or our, our TPA will outreach and, and say, 
hey, you know, if you go across the street to the other guy, it's going to be half the price. Um, people who are spending their own HRA money obviously are going to be highly motivated to do that. So we're introducing some consumerism on that uh, on that aspect as well. Um, but we're also throwing in um, things like Guru and, and GoodRx so that they can drive some of that on their own. Uh, we've also seen in some of our fully insured carriers in the area, they're doing this as well, but on a much more limited scale. Uh, on to the next slide. Um, obviously, this can be a tough sale um, for an employer, especially if you're within 30 days of the renewal. Um, it's hard to get them to listen and understand and grasp the strategy. And they, I think the big pushback that we tend to get is, how am I going to communicate this to my employees so they get it? My lowest common denominator isn't going to understand it. But one of the things we've done is we've built slides saying, this is what, at different spend levels, saying this is what that spend level would have cost you on your old plan. Here's what it looks like on the new plan. Um, if you if you really get down to the numbers, these these plans, if you're shifting to from a, a, a PPO plan um, to you know a higher deductible with a front end HR, HRA, well, obviously for anybody with less than a thousand dollars a year, they're going to get a hundred percent benefit. So this plan is going to be way better for them, and that can be up to sixty percent, you know, of your people on the plan. Uh, the second thing is. If you're doing this at 100% benefit after you reach the deductible, oftentimes it's even better for people who have catastrophic losses. So you're left with this 5 to 10% of the people in the middle that sometimes it's better and sometimes it's not better. And so you say, well, if it's only really going to affect 5 or 10% of the people, how does this work? And the reason that it works is that people spend that HRA money like their own money they don't spend it like plan money. They become highly motivated to drive down costs where they can. And if you marry that with um, uh, zero cost benefits for your critical chronic illnesses that can blow up on your plan, um, those two things together can be very powerful for controlling your costs. Um, I always think it's best to introduce this strategy off renewal, um, and I actually will take my employee education slides to a, a, and educate the employer as if the, as if the employer was, was a member on the plan, because they often are, um, and once they, once they understand, hey, this is really not such a bad deal, it's not, not so catastrophic, um, they get pretty excited about doing this. And that is all I have today. Great. Thank you very much, Tony. You know, at the end of your presentation there, you kind of began to anticipate one of the questions that we have for the group, and uh, I'll just put it to you first, and then the others can chime in. And that is, we're asking employees, consumers, patients to do a lot of different things that 10 years ago weren't even feasible. That means there's a lot of education going on, and some of you guys were throwing multiple tools at your clients. How much of the burden of doing the employee education do they expect you to share and you to pick up, or are these vendors stepping up and coming in and teaching how to use Guru? How does that education process take place? Tony, we'll start with you since you were bringing that issue up. Well, I, I tend to do this, and a lot of a couple of the uh, my uh, of my, pre my predecessors on this presentation will tell you that it's a step by step plan. You don't jump into the full blown thing in year one. So I will tend to move first to the to the HRA with a with a with a uh, high deductible, and I will educate people. You know, all right, here's here's what it looks like on the old plan. Here's what it looks like on the new plan, and that takes a lot of the stress away. And then I'll throw in something that's easy to use. Um, so some of these, like GoodRx, um, you'd be surprised. I, I mean, it's a it's a phone app. Um, a smartphone app, somebody can put that on their phone and it will, and they can enter their own prescription in it and it will tell them where it's cheapest to, to pick up. And 
So there are certain things that are just really, really easy to use. And then, so we'll start with those really easy to use things first. Um, we'll do the, we'll move to the HRA or the high deductible with an HRA. Um, and then we're always called upon to do the um, employee education. So we keep it simple and then we expand from there. Mark, you had a pretty big toolbox. Is that the yeah, same? I, uh, I think, for you know, first of all, yeah, uh, we really take a, a passionate approach to making sure that the folks we're working with um, uh, know that we're committed to education, as you might expect. At least in the solution we showed you, we're, we're working with educational institutions who have a, an interest in learning. Um, I think with our solution, it's less about the employees because, frankly, this is invisible uh, to the employee. It's the financing mechanism the organization is using to uh, to create efficiency. But on the member level, education is a big part of the process. We developed uh, our own app uh, called CDHB Coach uh, that helps people understand the terminology of what a consumer-driven health plan is all about. Uh, we work with our carrier partners or their, or their administrative partners to roll out that education and I'd also say it this way, Chuck. At the end of the day, you know, when Amazon was rolled out, nobody taught you how to use it, but I bet you know how now, right? Yeah. You using it? If, you, if you look at Uber, no one taught you how to use Uber, then you had to just download an app and you learned it, right? So at the end of the day, it's really not incumbent upon us to make sure the employee is educated. It is incumbent upon us to provide access to best-in-class tools and partners, but, but really people are smart. And if you give them access to the tools and they can see things and intuitively move around, uh, they will do what's in their what's in their best interest with the resources you provided them. Great. And so we move on to the next. I can, can I add something Please. to that as well? This is this is David. You know, one of the approaches that we take is that most employees are really good consumers already. I mean, my wife, she goes she doesn't like the meats at Walmart, but she goes to Walmart for all the boxed and canned goods because it's the same thing and it costs less and then we go somewhere for a little better meat. So we're making an assessment right there on cost and quality. The problem with our healthcare system is that we assign the blame to the insurance company. So the first step in our education process is to shift the employee's thinking to say, I am being taken advantage of, I'm being heavily taken advantage of, but it's not by the insurance company, it's not by my employer, it's by the healthcare system. And I am being shuffled through a system like a sheep who, in a system that is high cost and low quality. And as soon as we start to direct the frustration and the anger and the feeling of being taken advantage of at the real root of the problem, then all the other tools all of a sudden line up because now they want to go find them and now they, they seek those out. And whether it's the tools the employer provides or even tools they don't provide, when they're motivated to seek them out, they find them. Great. Mark, question for you. Um, you talked about using the captivated strategy with educational institutions, what are the advantages or disadvantages of having a homogenous group versus a heterogeneous group? Yeah, that, that's, a, excuse me, that's a great question. If we think about insurance companies traditionally, what are they? They're a heterogeneous pool of employers, right, and people. Um, the challenge with that is, is they present different risks and they present different ways of communicating. And so we made a conscious choice, well, A, because our footprint in this space is so big, uh, but B, because um, we really believe that we understand the risks associated. If you look from one school to the next, uh, the demographics are are very similar. The, their claim cost drivers are very similar. And frankly, the language they use uh, in their industry, in their specific niche, is also very um, um, excuse me, unique. And so we believe a homogenous pool gives us the ability to, uh, to program uh, more scientifically, more accurately. Uh, and also gives us the ability to create educational opportunities uh, for those uh, uh, messaging, rather. You know, if you think about it, the messages with regard to education, regard to being a better consumer. And so that's why we've chosen to uh, to, to focus on a modest pool. And frankly, one of the things I didn't mention is we're partnering with other strategic advisors across the country who have footprints in education. And so we're providing this opportunity for them to bring this solution to their clients uh, if they focus on that education institution. Now, you can also, Chuck, just by way of knowledge, you can apply this to other industries. So if the advisors on this uh, webinar today have a specific focus on a specific industry and uh, they want to let the power solution, they can do that too. In fact, in the future state, we'd like to be able to launch other industry verticals for the reason I just talked about. Great. David, on your job owning hospital prices slide, you 
talked about two different ways of going about this, of course. One is, you know, when you're doing a, a network. Uh, but the other was looked like it was an example of the local hospital. Um, who, when you're just negotiating with one hospital, is that negotiation you actually participate in? Is it done by a third party? How does that happen? I, we generally initiate the conversations. I am not a provider contracting expert by any means. <laughs> Um, what what I can do is, is I can tee up you know the conversation with the TPA and with the um, with the hospital administrator and actually hospitals are now dedicating people. We, I know the local hospital by us hired a network consultant from one of the carriers specifically to find the employers. They're in competition mode too, and they're competing against those big carriers. So or the big uh, hospital systems. I mean, so they're looking to find ways to differentiate themselves as well. And if they can find large local employers that are willing to create plan designs that drive them to the hospital, they're very open to those conversations find in most cases. Interesting. Um, Eric, you mentioned, you know, the Travera solution. In this case, was it you saying, what in the heck can I do about drug prices, and you went and found the solution? Or was this a solution that they came to you and said, we've got an offering that you might like? Well, it was actually um, after uh, years of dealing in uh, the self funding, and, and you know we keep calling prescription drug uh, just that that uh, black box. So it was, it was years of, of digging uh, underneath things, dealing, trying to find out, okay, well, what's going on with all these specialty medications, uh, all these other self funding contracts that may not have detailed uh, clarity around their rebates or what their discounts are, and. Um, uh, Traveris actually uh, approached us with this solution, and we've uh, we've embraced it full on, and been discussing this with all our clients, and it's just been very very well received, because that's one of the items that just goes unchecked uh, in these self funding models. They get the clients get these bills, or they get a, they get the, the bill from the carrier, and they just pay it. They don't know what's really behind it, and uh, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of moving parts, whether it's uh, varied. Uh, average wholesale price, price, price listings, um, but the big focus really, uh, I keep mentioning, is on that specialty because specialty drug lists went from probably a list of maybe 50 to 75 uh, a number of years ago to now a list of 400 uh, medications that are on these specialty listings. So um, it, it's a lot of moving parts and trying to do uh, analysis where you know where the pricing is going to fall based upon a, a, a Proposal that is submitted is almost impossible unless you've got the engine behind it to do that actual repricing. Great, thank you. Um, the number of cash applications and tools you guys mentioned are kind of bewildering. Um, I'd just be curious. Um, this question came in: Are you know, from a, a smaller broker uh, who maybe doesn't get called on as much as? Ones, but are these folks calling on you with Salesforce, or are you calling on them because you hear about the tool, and are you overwhelmed now with the way the market's moving and there's so much out there? Uh, why don't we start with you, Mark? I think it's important to, you know, like even Covey uh, uh, coined the phrase, sharpen the saw. And, uh, you know, essentially it's, it's our responsibility to stay on top of trends. It's our responsibility to look ahead and around the corner. That's what our clients expect of us. Uh, it's our ability to anticipate challenges our clients are going to have before they even know they're going to have them. So I think it's incumbent upon us to, to stay connected. LinkedIn I find to be a very powerful tool to the extent anybody's not using that. I can't imagine you wouldn't be, but if you aren't, um, really stay active. I'm on LinkedIn. Even if in my busiest days I spend time on LinkedIn at least reading one article. And it's not all from our industry. It's from other places. Silicon Valley is a, uh, you know, they're invading healthcare finally. Uh, if you think about it, I think healthcare is the last bastion that technology really might transform uh, a particular part of our industry and actually the biggest part, right, one-sixth of it anyway. Um, so I, I think it's important to stay on top of all these things, but I also think to the extent that you can leverage your membership in the National Association of Health Underwriters, they are spending more and more time and resources to, you know, essentially become the consumer reports, if you will, of different providers that are out there um, so that if you have a limited number of people in your office, you know, the people on this phone here today, or on the webinar, rather, all have, we all have infrastructure and people that do this stuff, but to the extent you don't, you can reach out to uh, NEHU, and there are resources available to you to 
at least get a handle and an education on the market that you're considering a service for your, for your uh, clients? That's an interesting answer, Mark, because one of the questions we got was how can we implement these ideas with the help of mentors and their expertise and make these concepts transferable? Um, how do we get in touch with people later? So I will leave that to Deborah Cook and the Nehu people to figure out how we facilitate next steps. But there is a capacity after the webinar ends to get back in touch with Nehu about how to go further with these things. Yeah, and Nehu has a lot of something. resources already, Chuck. So they already exist. That's just promoting them out to out to the peak, out to the people. And, and Chuck, I'll tell you, you know, that mentorship model is something that has done very well for me. I mean. Every one of us on this call was a small broker at one point, and I'm probably the smallest one on the call. But the way that you learn and the way that you grow, I believe, is not only by finding people who do things better than you and learning from them, but by giving away what you've learned and what works for you to others so that you're constantly moving forward and the industry as a whole is moving forward. I, I believe in this teamwork effort. I'm tired of us thinking that we have something that's so special that we don't want to share with our competition for fear of them learning it and doing it on their own. Um, I, I'm very open about what's worked and what hasn't worked for us. I know Mark is of the same cloth, and uh, I think that, that's the direction that we need to move in as an industry. Uh, question for Eric. What are the PBMs doing in order to express these levels of savings? Are they just charging lower drug prices, or what? Uh, there's a lot of uh, unknowns as far as how do these carriers, how do these PBMs make their money, and they're making their money on the spread. Yeah, they're making their money on the spread that the uh, actual contract is stipulating what what the discount is and what they're actually getting from the pharmacy. So there there there's multiple ways that they're making their money, and you can see, look at these an, their annual reports. I mean, these uh, carriers are making millions and billions of dollars, and um, but yet these the, the contracts that they're getting issued, a lot of the employer groups aren't even aware of some of these moving parts or not not participating in the rebates, for example. Um, so those are those are key areas that I would I would definitely focus and and start drilling into because it's something that hasn't been looked at in a while. Okay. Now, Mark, I'll admit I'm out of my depth on this next question, but it was directed to you. Can Mark elaborate more on the downside risks to the employer on partially self-funded programs such as claims run out on a 1218 contract? Yeah, I think the downside risk uh, for an employer, and I'm glad actually the. Uh, uh, the person submitted the question, making sure you've got the right stop-loss policy provisions are absolutely essential. Um, so as an example, in our program, we implemented a 1215 with a terminal liability protection so that we have run-out protection. Um, to the extent ICD-10 uh, ICD codes without getting too technical, delay, uh, delay uh, claim submission and reimbursement, perhaps a 1218 would be a better contract. Ours flips over to a 2412 in the second year. 36, 12, and so forth after that. So you make sure that your client has the right protection in place. Also make sure that the endorsement and the stop-loss contract are appropriate. So as an example, one of the things in self-insurance that can be detrimental if it's not covered correctly is to make sure that the stop-loss underwriter doesn't put in a lasering effect into the renewal. Well, essentially what that means is they call out the person who's got a significant claim issue and they put a separate deductible on that person as opposed to the plan deductible. And so you, the employer essentially has to pay a higher amount of liability for that sick individual. But if you negotiate that up front in the stop-loss contract, you can avoid unpleasant conversations. So that would be a couple examples. There are more. But there are a couple examples. You're going to want to make sure you have the right plan documents. And there's an organization called the FIA Group in Boston, P-H-I-A-L-L-C. Uh, they are masters of plan documents. So if any of you are are looking for folks who really know how to write a plan document uh, to make sure all the you know all the uh, I's are dotted and T's are crossed. They're a great organization for you to talk to. Great. Um, a couple of this question is just one that I have. In one of our earlier webinars, Suzanne Del Banco, who's the co-presenter with Mark throughout this series, talked about data spats between employers and their insurers and even self-funded employers in some cases not being able to get at their own data. Uh, a couple of you on this webinar talked about actually getting into the data analysis benefits I mean, business on behalf of your clients. Can you speak to where you see things going on the data front, and is it going to continue to be a tug-of-war with the insurers who increasingly see their data as a competitive advantage? Um, I don't know who wants to take that first, but... 
David, I, I, I think this you, is David. Yeah, I'd argue that that's a losing battle if you're going to try and get in, information from the insurance companies. They're giving less and less, and at the end of the day, it's their data. When you're fully insured, they have the full. It's their information. When you're self-insured or partially self-insured, it becomes the employer information, and again, it becomes the employer's uh, dime to live on, whether it's side or downside. But that's the whole point of this: is to say you need to take control of that. You understand the expenses on your P&L very well, except that one expense, um, and it gives you access to that so that you can make intelligent decisions around it. So I think it's a losing battle. I know carriers in North Carolina are closing down on the information they gave because it's allowing other um, insurance companies to cherry-pick the risk. So I, I think it's going to be tougher and tougher. Yeah, Chuck, and if I can come at it from a, uh, from a policy perspective, and I think you know I'm very passionate about this, uh, would be the whole transparency in healthcare cost and quality. Um, you know, in Massachusetts, we passed a law in 12 that just got implemented at the end of 14 that requires our health insurer to disclose the actual contracted cost, uh, the services that they make available to the people who they're insuring. And they also have the responsibility of telling those uh, members they cover what their out-of-pocket responsibility should be. Now, I'm not advocating for that specific solution, but I, but I do think a requirement that uh, health insurers uh, and providers, frankly, uh, disclose the cost of their services to the consumer is absolute requirement for us to have real cost reform. Uh, I, I don't understand how anyone can make any argument about tra uh, payment reform without first starting with transparency. How do you fix something you ha you can't see? And if you can't see it, you can't measure it, and therefore you can't improve it. it. It makes absolutely no sense. So I think as a you know, as an industry, we need to continue to advocate on behalf of our employer clients and their employees, frankly, the consumer, all of us, that we should have the access to the information. You know, I'll give you a great example but to reinforce my, my, my point. Uh, LASIK eye surgery, uh, which is not covered by health insurance. Uh, uh, we've seen in the last decade costs go up 18%, and on that same time period, quality has gone up tenfold. So, so cost is actually not rising as much as health insurance. You look at the same period in time, healthcare costs in general over a hundred percent increase in cost. Why? Because one part of it's visible, that's LASIK eye surgery, and the other part of it's not. So when when you have a visible market, people can actually start to compete on value, which is both cost and quality. So I don't, I think from a policy perspective, the more we can continue to make a push. Uh, for total transparency, then we can really get at improving quality and lowering cost. Eric or Tony, anything to add? Okay, then why don't we go to the next slide. I think as we mentioned earlier, this is the ninth in a series of ten webinars, and it's NAHU Education Foundation intent to take these first nine them is continuing education. And it's been a nice impression. I think today on the call, we heard four fantastic presentations, all from, you know, with similar themes, but from different points of view, different solutions. Some people like full first dollar, some people don't, some like HRA, some like HSAs. So, you know, lots of different food for thought to chew on, but it all culminates and builds on what came before this. So all of it starting back with the very first introduction to the changes taking place in healthcare. And in these presentations that we're going to put together as the continuation package, you'll be able to find things like, you know, David talked about the World Health Corps, Healthcare Organization's charting of outcomes. Well, in the toolkit we're putting together for brokers, there are slides that will enable you to show clients where we rank in the world in terms of cost and quality of healthcare. And it will build all the way through that to explanatory slides on benefit design. Plus, it will be packaged up with a webinar. So that toolkit is being done now because it builds on these first nine webinars and it's under development and when we get it ready to go, it will be introduced as well as the CE component will be introduced um, with an upcoming webinar that we're calling How to Become an Influencer and Educator on Payment Reform. Uh, our hope is that these tools will empower and enable brokers, advisors, agents to start conversations in their community. Um, some cases, maybe use them with employers or at least maybe at a 30,000-foot level to talk to the Rotary Club about where payment reform and transparency is heading. But in any event, that's the toolkit we're putting together now, and we hope it will be of great benefit to folks as they move, because everybody on this call seems to point out, as you're moving from being a uh, person who stands in between a client and insurance company for a rate renewal to becoming a genuine advisor. 
And we thank you for joining us on the call today and remind you, you can watch the entire series at the link you see on the screen. And with that, thanks again to our presenters today. Fantastic job. And I think it's a ton of food for thought for the people on the call. And with that, I will hand it back to you, Jennifer. All right, thank you very much to today's presenters. We also thank each of you for participating in today's program. This concludes Webinar 9, Value-Based Purchasing in Action. Advisors share their strategies. Presented by the National Association of Health Underwriters Education Foundation.